<clears throat> well, welcome again to the School of Tyrannus, pattern after the school where the Apostle Paul taught in the city of Ephesus, as we read about in the 19th chapter of Acts. And the Lord blessed him with uh, uh, tremendous results. The whole area heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And it is our desire to give the same attention to the Word of God as they did when the Apostle Paul taught in Ephesus. And we are <coughs> uh, doing the review and the final exam for the first half of the book of Acts, Acts 1 through 14. Now we have a special treat for us after we finish the exam the review, the exam, and the uh, grading. Uh, we have back in town our, our own pastor, Tom Terry, and his wife, Barbara, who have returned from uh, Israel. And uh, uh, he's going to lead us in our uh, prayer time but also give us a report about Israel, uh, what what the Lord has done through them there. Now see, while we were studying the book of Acts, uh, he and Barbara were out doing it uh, over in Israel. All right. <clears throat> what we want to do first is the review of the first 14 chapters and what we uh, have done was try to pick out the high points or some of the main thoughts in uh, in the book because we can't cover everything, but we will cover uh, the high points. For instance, as we open our book of Acts, we have uh, uh, an astonishing question asked by the apostles of the Lord Jesus before He departed before his ascension. In verse 6, and, and what was that question? Is it time for you to restore the kingdom to Israel? Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Was that a logical question? I believe it was. Some people say, no, that was uh, foolish of them to ask such a question. I believe it was perfectly logical, reasonable, and understandable, and scriptural for them to ask such a question. Jesus had done everything uh, that the Messiah was supposed to do at His first coming. He had come, He had teached, He had taught. <laughs> he had taught, He had done miracles, He had uh, uh, died for our sins, and He had risen from the grave. What else was left but to restore the kingdom to Israel? But how does he answer them? It's not for you to know the times and the seasons. It is for you to know the content. The kingdom will be restored to Israel. And you understand that and you know that. But you don't. what you don't know is the timing that the Lord, the Father, has put in His own hand. And so He tells them, as far as what you are concerned about, you go back to Jerusalem and receive the Holy Spirit and be witnesses to Me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Okay? Um... And that uh, is this, another point there. Uh, he, he tells them the Great Commission. And notice the four parts of their witnessing. Jerusalem first, Judea, Samaria, then the whole Gentile world. Uh, and they were responsible for that commission. And aren't you glad that... Uh, they took it seriously. Amen. And the gospel indeed has come to the uttermost parts of the earth, from Jerusalem to Texas and many other places. Uh, 
Well, they do go back to Jerusalem and uh, they wait and they pray and the Lord sends the Holy Spirit. And we see a, a remarkable uh, miracle attending the descent of the Holy Spirit. And in verses 7 and 8 of chapter 2, uh, the hearers said they couldn't understand anything that was going on. Is that right? No. 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 They understood perfectly what was going on. They understood perfectly what uh, the people were saying. Well, what was so amazing about that? They were a bunch of dumb, ignorant Galileans. They were the, yeah. And where were the hearers from? All over the world. All, all over the world. From all different countries. And they heard in their own language, their own native tongue. Of course, everybody spoke Greek. But they heard in their own native tongue the message that the Galilean uh, disciples were speaking about the Messiah, the crucified and risen Messiah. And uh, 3,000 people were saved. Um, <clears throat> And you continue on in Peter's message, uh, in uh, beginning with verse 25, and the the apostle Peter per persuades the Jewish people that were there in Jerusalem that the Messiah had to rise from the dead. Now you think about how you would persuade a Jewish person who believed the Old Testament that the Messiah has to rise from the dead, how would you do it? Well, in verse 25 and following, uh, what does the Apostle Peter use? What passage of Scripture? Pardon? Uh, I can't hear you. Psalm 16. Yes. And uh, so he uses Psalm 16. Well, later we find out that Paul uses the same passage when he is addressing the Jewish people. So it's very important for us to understand uh, the 16th Psalm when it comes to proving the resurrection of the Messiah from the dead. Uh, and he concentrates uh, on the part that says, Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And he argues that David did see corruption, the man who wrote the psalm. But the one of whom he was speaking did not. He was speaking of his own son, his descendant, his seed, who would be the Messiah and who would die. And his body would be in the tomb but and his soul would be in Hades, but his body would not see corruption. Because he would be raised from the dead. So that was a very powerful, powerful argument as to the resurrection of the Messiah. Uh, in verse 36, we have uh, uh, the major theme of Peter's message on Pentecost. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That was the major thing of the whole message. Jesus, the one that they had seen doing miracles, teaching in the temple, ministering, uh, doing miracles whom they had turned over to Pilate to be crucified. God has made Lord. Adonai, as uh, Bob was telling us earlier, singing to us. And Christ, Christos, Mashiach, Messiah. That was the message. And that's what Cut them to the heart. 
Then he goes on uh, in, a, in another message uh, later on, a few days later, in uh, chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. And he says, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive until, that's a time word there, the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now, they had the content. There was the times of refreshing and the times of restoration of all things. What did he mean by that? Talk about the millennial kingdom. The millennial kingdom, which included the second coming of Christ. And he would restore all things. He would restore Israel. Uh... Restore the kingdom to Israel. Restore the land to Israel. And uh, bring in the millennial kingdom. The nations of the earth would be blessed and walk in the light of the Lord. All the things that the prophets had foretold since the world began. And what was needed? The repentance of Israel. The repentance and faith of Israel. When, Je when Israel receives Jesus... The times of refreshing will come. The times of the restoration of all things will come. As it is, the remnant of Israel has received the Lord, but not the nation. One day, the nation will receive the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, the times of the restoration of all things will come about. Uh, in... Uh, Verse uh, in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So, what was it about their message uh, that caused the people, uh, the captain of the priest's guard and the priest, to arrest him. They were preaching resurrection. Yes. Because in Jesus, the resurrection. It. Yeah, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. Yeah. They didn't like that. In the name of Jesus. Uh, yes. Question. Pardon? What was the uh, the, the response was they were preaching the resurrection, and, and in Jesus was the resurrection. The disciples were teaching that? The, yes, Peter and John specifically. Uh, and they were greatly disturbed about this. Uh, why? Because they thought they had done away with Jesus, uh, that he was an imposter, that he was a false messiah, that he was a blasphemer. Uh, and they were they were convinced that they had gotten rid of. Him. Now they're saying that he uh, that he is risen from the dead, and that uh, they are preaching the resurrection through Jesus. So they had them arrested. And uh, verses uh, ten through twelve, when they stood before the Sanhedrin. Peter said in verses uh, 10, verse 10 of chapter 4, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel. This is still concentrating on the Jewish people and the message to Israel. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God has raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole, a man that they had healed. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So, um, well, how would you uh, characterize Peter's 
message to the Sanhedrin. Not very inclusive. Not not very inclusive. By me, meaning what? Meaning that they weren't included in all the other ways to get to heaven. Yes. Only one. There's only one way to get to heaven, and what is that? That's Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. Well, besides he was... Not only was he not feeling apologetic, he was in their face about, yeah, I'm preaching the resurrection, it happened. <laughs> yes. Uh, the comment is that he, he was uh, not apologetic, and he was in their face, as it were, saying, yes, it has happened. And even though you crucified him, he has risen from the dead. Uh, and he is working miracles today as they had a witness before them. Um, then in same chapter 4, 27 and 28, uh, the people are praying to the Lord, and in this prayer they mention who is responsible for the death of Jesus. For Verse 27, For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed... <clears throat> Both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. So, who's responsible thus far for the death of Jesus? Everybody. Israel, the Gentiles, the specific kings, Herod, Antipas, and uh, Pilate, the procurator. Then verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So who else is responsible for the sacrifice of Jesus? God the Father. He planned it from the beginning. He orchestrated it. He accomplished it. And even though these people are responsible for their deeds, including us, uh, this was a divine purpose that was absolutely necessary for salvation to be accomplished. Um, in chapter 5, we have the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Verse 3 and 4. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And he died. That is, Ananias died. And later on, his wife died. Why did they die? Because they tried to deceive God. They what? They tried to deceive God. Deceive God? Was it because they were stingy? No. No. Uh, it, they, they lied to God. How did they lie to God? They lied to Peter. They lied to Peter. Now, isn't that interesting? Uh, if you lie to the apostles, you're lying to God. And by derivation, it might be understood that if you lie to the church, the body of Christ, you're lying to the Holy Spirit, you're lying to God. Yes? But isn't that kind of like the same thing with David? Because, you know, uh, his when he did the whole Bathsheba thing and killed Uriah, you would think that his sin was committed against Uriah and Bathsheba even. But he said, against you and you only have I sinned. Yeah. Uh, the point is that uh, in the case of David, when he killed Uriah, and he had committed adultery against Uriah, uh, when he made his confession, he said, I have sinned against you and you only. Uh, to, saying to God. So there is a level in which, yes, we uh, sin against people, but our ultimate sin against is against God. And this is what they were doing. And to teach the church a lesson. He made Ananias and Sapphira an example. And they died on the spot. They were the only people I know in the Scriptures that were slain by the Spirit. But 
that was their situation. And uh, the uh, it was uh, it, it made them fearful. It made them uh, a very. Uh, they were dealing with serious stuff here with this new <coughs> entity, uh, the body of Christ, which was in its infancy, and which may have been looked upon as being a rather insignificant thing. The Lord was demonstrating was a very uh, real thing and was not to be trifled with. Um, okay. <clears throat> then we have um, uh, another confrontation with the uh, Sanhedrin in chapter 5, verse 28. Uh, and they level a charge against Peter. And John, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. So what were they charging them of? Preaching the resurrection? Uh, the resurrection? And, and they were preaching in whose name? Jesus, that, in this name, you, you're. We told you not to teach in this name. That's when you don't want to mention the name of the person, like this woman or something like that. Uh, this name, you are not to preach in this name, and uh, uh, you are trying to bring this. You're trying to make us guilty of this man's blood. Well, they were somewhat true in that charge. And they were guilty of this man's blood, Christ's blood. Okay, just as we all are. But we are not all equally innocent. We are all equally guilty of the blood of Christ. If the Scriptures teach us anything, it teaches us that. Uh, Then we go into chapter 6, and um, we see a division of responsibilities, a division of labor. And we see it spelled out in verses 3 and 4. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we, whom we <clears throat> may appoint to this over this business. Now, what business was that? Taking care of the widows. Taking care of the widows and making sure they got uh, the, their portion of the meal that was being served uh, at lunchtime or dinner or whatever it was. Uh, that was their business. And what kind of men do you need for that service? Holy men. Holy men. Wisdom. Full of the Holy Spirit. Wise. Good. Uh, <laughs> to uh, make sure that the widows got their food. This Again, it's, it's teaching us that any business of the body of Christ is serious business and needs to be done by serious people who are committed to the Lord. You don't just drag somebody off the street and say and hire them and say, well, uh, let's do this. Uh, you do that. Uh, it, it, to, to do anything in the body of Christ requires men who are full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. Uh, and then what, what will the apostles do? Verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And that was a... Some people were making sure that the widows got their food and others were responsible for prayer and for the ministry of the Word. And that's what the apostles were doing. They were teaching the Word of God. And praying for the Lord's guidance. And uh, that that's a different business. That's a different <coughs> ministry. That's a different work. But what the men did, the seven men, was a ministry also. A ministry for the Lord. Uh, the Apostle Paul talks about being sure to take care of those who labor in the Word. Labor in the Word. And that's what the apostles were doing, laboring in the Word. Uh, 
Ministry of the Word. Okay. That was their division of labor. Uh, in chapter 7, we have in verse 13, uh, we have in this whole chapter, Stephen's message before he was stoned to death. And he became the first martyr of the church. Uh, and in verse 13 uh, is the first mention that Stephen makes of Israel in their past history rejecting one of the Lord's prophets the first time and then on the second occasion accepting him and receiving him and being reconciled to him. In this case, it is Joseph. Verse 13, And the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. They were now reconciled. Whereas before, years ago, uh, Joseph had been sold by his eleven brothers into slavery. They had rejected him. They were He was a dreamer. He was... Uh, dangerous brother. Uh, he was unwelcome in the family and they kicked him out. Now he is the vizier of Egypt, <coughs> but he welcomes them and they are reconciled. So there is a, the first example of a prophet that was rejected the first time, accepted the second time. And in uh, verse 35... We see the second example. This Moses, whom they rejected, you know, the first time, as their deliverer, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? Is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush? So, in the first occasion, when he killed the Egyptian to help out a Hebrew brother, they rejected him. Who's, who made you a ruler over us? Who made you our king? Who, who made you our deliverer? Now, the second time, with signs and wonders and so forth, Israel received Moses and he led them out of Egypt. And then in verse 51, Stephen says to his audience of Jewish people, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. By rejecting Jesus, by rejecting the, His death, his resurrection, his ministry, and his now his apostles and uh, teachers and witnesses and disciples, you are resisting the Holy Spirit just as you much as you did, your fathers did in Joseph's time and in Moses' time. And this is a Jew speaking to a Jew. This is an in-house thing. And uh, he said, you're doing the same thing. Rejecting Jesus at His first coming, the implication is you will receive Him at His second coming. In chapter 8, verses 14 and 15, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the Word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter had the keys to the kingdom. God, uh, Jesus gave the keys to the kingdom to Peter. He had opened the keys to the Jews when? Hmm? At, Pentecost. At Pentecost. Yes, at Pentecost. Now, who was he opening the keys to? 
the, Samar the Samaritans. The Samaritans. Exactly. So another door was being opened. Also, uh, Judeans uh, had received uh, the word at the same time as uh, the Jews did in Jerusalem. So uh, now we have it open to the Samaritans, the half Jews, the half breeds who were uh, lived in the land uh, by Peter's hand. And they received this Holy Spirit much the same as did the Jews on the day of Pentecost. So the door was open to them. Uh, then we uh, go on in the 8th ch chapter to uh, the 32nd verse. The place in, this script, in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. And what passage is that in? Where is he reading from? Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. And Peter, uh, rather Philip, started at that point and led the Ethiopian uh, to the Lord. Um uh, now we get to Saul, Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the Jewish Christian church. And uh, in verse 2, chapter 9, verse 2, we read uh, that Saul asked letters from the high priest to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, that is, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, what? who was Saul authorized to, to bring back his prisoners to Jerusalem? Was it Gentile Christians or was it Jewish Christians? Jewish, Jewish. Jewish Christians. In what, in what chapter and verse are you? Uh, chapter 9, verse 2. Uh, yeah, the only... Christians there were, were Jewish Christians at the time and, and some Samaritans. Uh, so there weren't any Gentile Christians. Uh, Paul was not really concerned about uh, Gentile Christians. I mean, or any Gentiles anyway. Whatever they they were pagans anyway. He wasn't going to bring any of them back to Jerusalem for trial. It was Jews who had gone astray, he felt, who were become blasphemers. And who were believing in this man Jesus, this carpenter from Nazareth. And uh, he was going to make sure that they were brought to uh, account. Uh, and, and jailed, possibly killed. But we learned, and Paul, Saul learned on the road to Damascus who he was really persecuting. Verses 3 and 4. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone round about him from heaven... Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So, he, he was not persecuting just the Jewish believers in Jesus. He was persecuting Jesus. And uh, then he had that transformation experience. He was a different man. From then on, when he received Christ. Uh, then he was saved. And then he became an evangelist. A, a hot evangelist for the Lord. In, in uh, verse 20 to 22. Immediately he, Saul, preached the Christ in the synagogues. That he is the Son of God. And... Uh, is, then all who heard were amazed and said, Is not this the one who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem? And has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? <clears throat> What's happened to this guy? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. He could prove from the Old Testament Scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah that they had been looking for and waiting for. Uh, then we go back to Peter in uh, 
in, jo in uh, uh, Joppa in chapter 9, verse 40. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed and turning to the body of Dorcas there. He said, Tabitha, arise. That was her Hebrew name. And she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. Alive. So a great miracle, similar to one that Jesus had performed in Capernaum, was done by Peter. A, resur a, a resuscitation from the dead. Uh, then uh, we get in chapter 10, we see the first Gentile to come to the Lord. That was Cornelius, a centurion of the hated occupying Roman army in Israel. But this man, verse 2, uh, verse 1 in chapter 10, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. A devout man and one who feared God with all his household and who gave alms generously to the people, to the people of Israel, and prayed to God always. Uh, remarkable Gentile man for a soldier. Uh, he was close to, to God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, even though he, he was not certainly not a Jew, he was not a proselyte, but he, he believed the word of God that he had. Uh, and that committed him to God, and God <laughs> sent Peter to him, uh, who had to have his own transformation, verse uh, 44 of chapter 10. While well, Peter... So wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm, uh, in chapter 10, 17, I'm sorry. Um, now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision would mean, which he had seen meant, behold, uh, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for, for uh, Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. They had come to take Peter to Caesarea. Uh, and uh, he, he learned from the vision that he better go with them. That what God had cleansed, do not call unclean. But then when he got there to Cornelius' house and preached the gospel to them in verse 44, while Peter was still speaking, these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard, all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished because many, as, uh, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Okay. So, uh, then we have uh, chapter 11. Verses 2 and 3. Not everybody liked what Peter was doing. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ate with them. You, you've really gone trait. You have really gone unkosher. You, you have really broken the law. Uh, what shall we do? Uh, but Peter explaining to them in order from the beginning said, and he gave the explanation to them of why he had done what he had done uh, and how the Lord had blessed. Then we have the story in 11 uh, 25 that Barnabas down in Antioch in uh, uh, Syria. Uh, went to get Saul. Then Paul departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. What did they do? Why did he bring Saul to Antioch? Because he knew the Scripture. 
He knew the scripture, and what would he do with the scripture? He knew how to convince them of Jesus. Yeah. He, he would he would teach. He would teach the word to the church. It's a pretty good thing to do, don't you think? Okay. Uh, Then, then we have this peculiar story about Peter being in jail and uh, uh, being released by the angel and then coming to Mary's house. What was so comical, I won't read the passage, what was so comical about Peter at Mary's house? They would release, and then wouldn't believe he'd been released. Yeah. They, they knocked on the door. He knocked on the door. They uh, wrote him, saw him, and came back and said, "Peter's out there." And they said, "No, he can't be." And they wouldn't let him in because they didn't believe it. And uh, even though they had been praying for him, okay. Um, I've got to hurry here because we're out of time. But just bear with me for a second here. Uh, then we have the death of Herod Agrippa, the first. How did he die? You remember that? He was speaking and had that great voice. And they said, this is the voice of a God and not of a man. And he accepted their laudits and praise. And God proved he was a man because he it, died. He, he was a man. And how did he die? Worms ate him. And this is confirmed by uh, Josephus in his history. Uh, when we get now to the first missionary journey, we have Paul and Barnabas going to Antioch in Pisidia. And what method of evangelism did they use? First to the synagogue. First to the synagogue. It was synagogue evangelism, where they would proclaim the gospel to the Jews first. Uh, how did Paul prove that the Messiah had risen from the dead? And what scripture did he use? Psalm 16. Psalm 16, indeed. Uh, just like Peter had used. They loved that passage. Jesus loved that passage. Uh, and it, it's something we should be fully aware of. Um, what was the reaction on the second Saturday in Antioch when Paul and Barnabas were again in the, in the synagogue? A whole bunch of people there, and the Jews got jealous. Yes. How many people? I don't mean a number, but the whole city, almost the whole city turned out to hear what they had said. What an amazing reaction just from one week in the city. What city? The city of Antioch in Pisidia. Then when they got to Lystra, they were worshipped mistakenly. When they tried to stop them from doing it, what happened to Paul and Barnabas? Did they try to make images? Uh huh? Did they try to make images of them or something? They, uh, they stoned them. Yeah, they were fickle. And um, and then uh, coming back through the cities of Lystra and Derby and and. Uh, Antioch and Iconium, what did Paul do to organize the churches? Pointed elders. Pointed elders in every church. And that was the only organization he gave them. He appointed elders in every church. Okay, well that is the first 14 chapters of... Uh, uh, Alright, now, let's try to go through this quickly. Number one. Uh, who got number one? Nobody got number one. <laughs> huh? All got it? Give me an example. Uh, George, did you get it? What? You at this time restore the kingdom. Yes, and how did he respond? Not for you to know. Uh, yeah. Uh, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And the Lord said, uh, it, it's not for you to know the times. <coughs> Uh, it is for you to know the content. <coughs> the Lord is going to restore the kingdom to Israel. But you're not going to know the timing of it. And that is uh, in the Father's own hand. It hasn't occurred yet. Uh, number two. Who got number two? Oh, yes, yes, ma'am, Mary. Uh, what, what's the answer? So all the four people had come in could hear it in their own language. 
all the people. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That's number three. That's okay. We'll look at number three. We'll go back to two. Uh, all, <clears throat> what was the effect of, on the people of the Holy Spirit's bestowing tongues on the disciples? And everybody heard the, uh, the message of the gospel in their own language. And they understood perfectly what was going on. Now let's go back to number two. Who got number two? Witnesses. Witnesses. Even unto the end of the earth. To the ends of the earth. But where first? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Are we in the uttermost here? Those are Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> they're Jesus' Witnesses. Okay, yeah, look at it. Okay, we did number three. Number four. Who got number four? Psalm 16. Psalm 16. Yeah, Psalm 16. Okay, you got that. Now, are you going to go home and memorize Psalm 16 so you'll be prepared to utilize it? Okay. Allow your Holy One to see Christ. There you go. All right. Uh, you already memorized that part, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> number five. What was the primary theme of Peter's message? God made Jesus the Lord and Messiah. Uh, he has made Jesus both Lord and Messiah, Christ. Uh, very good. Uh, number six. Who got that? Yes. When Israel received Jesus as their Messiah. When, when Israel receives Christ nationally, there will come the times of refreshing and the times of the restoration of all things. Yeah. yeah. Number seven. Why were Peter and John arrested by the priests and the guards? They were teaching Jesus. Preaching, preaching the resurrection. Preaching, the resurrection. preaching, yeah. Yeah. They were preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Huh. That's enough to get you in trouble in some places, isn't it? Even today. Yeah. Even today. Absolutely. Number eight. What was Peter's basic message to the Sanhedrin? No salvation. No one else. There is salvation in no other name. Except the name of Jesus. That's not uh, uh, very ecumenical, is it? It's not politically correct. And it's not politically correct. Is it scriptural? Yes. Yeah. Would you rather be politically correct or scripturally correct? Yeah. yeah, that's what we're aiming for. Uh, number nine, according to 4 27 28, who is responsible for the death of Jesus? And who were who were listed? Israel and the Gentiles and God Himself. Yes. Okay. Number ten. Why were Ananias and Sapphira killed? Lied to God. Lied to God about their gift. Number eleven. What was the charge that the Sanhedrin brought against Peter and John? Preaching in the name of Jesus after they've been told not to. Yeah. You're not supposed to do that, are you? And uh, Paul, uh, Peter asked him whether they're supposed to obey God or man. Well, who are we supposed to obey if there's a conflict? God. Twelve. How did they divide the responsibility between the apostles and the deacons? Apostles were to do the prayer and ministry, and the deacons were to do distribution of the food. The, the apostles were to do prayer and ministry in the word, and the deacons were to make sure that the, uh, the widows got their portion of food. That was a big job. Needed good men to do that. Uh, Thirteen. What two main personalities did Israel reject the first time and then accept later? Joseph, Joseph was the first one. Who was the second? Joseph. Moses. Yeah. And that set the pattern for what they were doing about Jesus. Reject him the first time, receive him the second time. <clears throat> and uh, Stephen lost his head over that. Uh, Would that be considered a type? Exactly. I believe since Stephen uses it them as examples, then they would be a type.
And I have a high bar for being a type. It has to be scripturally authenticated illustrations. Uh, Fourteen. Having used the keys of the kingdom to open the way to the Jews, what was the next group to receive the Holy Spirit through Peter? Samaritans. The Samaritans. They were not greatly liked among the Jews, and the Jews were not greatly liked among the Samaritans. Nevertheless, now they could receive the Lord and be part of the body of Christ. Fifteen. What passage is the Ethiopian reading and felt used to bring him to Christ? Isaiah 53. Can't beat that. Who, 16, who was Saul authorized to arrest and bring back as Jewish prisoners to Jerusalem? Jewish, Jewish believers in Christ. He could, he could care less what the Gentile pagans were doing. Number 17, who was Saul actually persecuting? Jesus. Jesus. He thought he was persecuting these blasphemers and bringing them to justice. Instead, he found out he was persecuting the Messiah himself, Jesus. 18. What two messages did Saul present in the synagogues in Damascus? Jesus is the Son of God and the Christ. He is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God and He is the Messiah. In the synagogues in Damascus. Mm. 19. What startling miracle did Peter perform in Joppa? And what was the result? Raised up darkness from the dead. And what happened after that? Many people in Joppa believed with him. Number 20. What four characteristics commended Cornelius to God? He was devout, feared God, made alms to the people, uh, apparently the Jewish people there, and prayed. He prayed. This is unsaved Gentile. Uh, was commended to God because. This was his character. 21. How did the Lord persuade Peter to go to Cornelius' house? Yes. Rise, Peter, kill and eat the, the, the food that was there. He was hungry. It was noontime. And, uh, but he'd never eaten unclean animals. And there was all these creeping things and uh, unclean animals along with the clean. He said, no, Lord. But then he learned, what I have cleansed do not call unclean. And that pertained to food, but it even more importantly pertained to people. That God was going to clean up some Gentiles. And he was to have, Peter was to have fellowship with them. Uh, and they would have the Holy Spirit just like he did. Uh, at verse 20, number 22. How did Peter know that the door was open, was now open to the Gentiles? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit came down upon them just like he had come upon the Jews at Pentecost. And they spoke in tongues, the other languages, uh, foreign languages. Perhaps they even spoke in Hebrew and in Aramaic, and these uh, Galileans understood what they were saying. 23. What objections did those of the circumcision make against Peter for doing this? He went in among the Gentiles, into a Gentile house, and he ate with them. Well, that's what the Lord had told him to do. Uh, and he gave defense of his actions. Number 24, why did Barnabas get Paul, go to get Paul in Tarsus? They needed somebody to teach the word in uh, Antioch, and he couldn't think of a better teacher than the Apostle Paul. Um, brought him there, a hundred miles, and, and he taught the word there in Antioch. 25. What was so comical about the episode of Peter at Mary's house? They wouldn't let him in. They wasn't knocking on the door. And they said, uh, and yet they were praying for his release. They said, it can't be him, he's in jail. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a lot of humor in the scriptures. And I guess they, after they 
let him in and they talk. I mean, I, I bet they talked about that all night long. Uh, how remarkable it was and how comical it was. Number 26. Describe how Herod Agrippa died and why. He died of worms and uh, why? Because he, he was did not give God the glory. He was being praised as a God and the Lord smote him with worms. Uh, what method of evangelism was used by Paul and Antioch in Pisidia? Synagogue, Jewish evangelism. Very dangerous type of evangelism, but very productive, I would suggest. And it is consistently his methodology uh, throughout his ministry, wherever possible. Number 28. How did Paul prove that the Messiah had to rise from the dead? Psalm 16. So that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Psalm 16, same passage that Peter used on Pentecost. we got to know that passage, folks. Number 29. What was the reaction on the second Saturday Paul was in the synagogue? The whole city came together. Almost the whole city came together. Here, the Word of God. How would you like to be in a town for two weeks and the whole city comes out to hear the word of God. Well, that happened to, to Paul. And it was, I believe, in part through the audacious uh, methodology of synagogue evangelists. Number 30. How did the people in Lystra show how fickle they were? They, they were going to worship uh, Paul and Barnabas, who would have none of it, said, no, don't worship us, worship God. They were going to be like Herod Agrippa and get eaten up by worms. And so then the people turned against them and uh, stoned them to death. Uh, there, you, there you have a fickle crowd. Uh, <clears throat> and Paul was left for dead. It could be that's when he went to the third heaven, uh, as he records in uh, Corinthians. Um, at any rate, they left him for dead. Whether he was really dead and came back to life or or not, uh, they, they left him for dead. They thought he was dead. 31. How did Paul organize the new churches which he had founded? He ordained elders in every church. Plural. There's plurality of elders in each church. Uh, there's some debate about how many elders you can have in a church or should have in a church. Uh, Paul appointed elders in each church. And uh, that was the organization that led the church uh, from then on. Now, they had other responsibilities, other uh, jobs and so forth, but the elders uh, were the key personalities and <coughs> were responsible for leadership. <coughs> 